Well, listen, it's wonderful to be here this evening. My name is Zaki Anastasiu. I'm going to be facilitating this session. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, at Gibbs. Um, and who is here for the first time, by the way? Okay, fantastic. Lovely to have you with us this evening. Um, and uh, a very warm welcome as well to uh, Abdullah Varachi, who is the CEO of Strategy, uh, Strategist and the Faculty and Program Director for the Gibbs Executive Program. Nice to have you with us. And um, uh, together, Abdullah and I are facilitating and hosting this iStore Meet in partnership with the Gibbs Business Series. And um, super excited to be here tonight on this panel. We've got such a fantastic panel of speakers tonight. And of course, those of you who have uh, been watching this particular series, it's online. Just uh, go onto YouTube and look at iStore Meets and type in the word Gibbs as well, and you'll come up with all the different, uh, uh, you know, different talks that we've had. We've got quite a few coming up, and it's such an important segment, small, medium-sized businesses. We know that they are the powerhouse of our economy and how important they are, and we're going to look at different facets of the impact that the businesses have. And tonight, we're going to be talking specifically about uh, technology in business. Uh, is it a disruptor? or is it an enabler? So a warm welcome to my panel. Sitting on my right-hand side is uh, Pragashni Reddy, who is the Head of Technology Digital Enablement at Standard Bank Corporate and Investment Banking. Lovely to have you with us. I'm gonna ask each of you to give us an introduction uh, after I've introduced you, and you can tell us more about what you do. Uh, next to uh, Pragashni is uh, Nomonde White and Glove, who is the Chief Information Officer for Bidvest Bank. Um, and then AJ Lalu is a qualified chartered accountant, and he's also an entrepreneur. Do you know why we can tell he's an entrepreneur? Just look at the way he's dressed tonight. <laughs> he's casual, he's, uh, he, was, uh, he went to bed at 12 o'clock last night, he was up at six. This man is a serial entrepreneur. And sitting next to him is uh, Professor, none other than uh, Pr Professor Manoj Chiba, Director of Data Science, Senior Principal Consultant, B-School Professor and Advisory Board Member. So, Listen, I, it's just like a brief introduction. Just tell us 30 seconds a little bit about yourself and what you do in your particular roles. Pragashni, you're at Standard Bank. You've got a fancy title, Head of Technology and Digital Enablement. So a perfect candidate to tell us if technology is a disruptor or an enabler. So what do you do at Standard Bank? So I head up the entire technology team for corporate and investment banking for South Africa and, and for Africa. And what we are involved with as a collective team is the design and maintenance of all our systems and processes. We re-engineer and um, really look for a systematic way on how do we align with the latest technologies internationally so that we have a benchmark platform that we can then operate from in totality as a as a bank for Fantastic. Uh, Nomonde White and Lovu, uh, Chief Information Officer at Bidvest Bank. Yes, this is what do you, who I am. What do you do at Bitvest Bank? I am an enabler, so um, <laughs> I look after tech. Um, and I'd say I enable business to achieve their strategic ambitions. I think we all know that all corporate organizations are moving towards a digital strategy, so I'm proudly Bitvest. We are the home of entrepreneurs. We want to make sure, from a bank perspective, that all entrepreneurs win. So I'm in the back end making sure that we give you seamless access to credit if you need it. Shout out to Bitvest, you can come to us. We're happy to you know, help you if you're looking for startup capital. We're all about making sure that we build entrepreneurship in this country. Um, and we want to do that digitally. So I'm all about ensuring that we drive our business strategy and it aligns to what we are wanting to do, which is to help all small and big business win. Fantastic. Now, you, you know all about entrepreneurship, small and medium-sized businesses, uh, AJ. So tell us a little bit about what you do. Um, yeah, I dream up ideas, and then people like Manoj and others make them a reality. So we're uh, a tech startup uh, that's about to go global. Um, we won Innovator of the Year this year by Brand South Africa. Congratulations. Congratulations. And, um, Microsoft Corporation in the USA signed a global strategic alliance agreement with us. Um, so I suppose when a $3 trillion company decides that we have innovation that is going to go global and disrupt the world, then I think we must be doing something right. 
Yeah. So. You guys are welcome to take pictures right now because this could be <laughs> could be that Elon Musk uh, kind yeah. of level in a few years' time. So you, you heard him first at Gibbs for those of you exposed to AJ. Uh, keep it on your lips to God's ears, yeah. please. No, yeah. <laughs> but that's wonderful. But AJ, you know what? It is a lonely world being uh, an entrepreneur yeah. and doing what you're doing. We'll get into it in a second. But uh, congratulations. And it's a Thanks. phenomenal achievement. And we wish you best of luck in, in uh, going forward. It, it doesn't come easy. There's a lot of hard work. Uh, enabling what you're doing. Uh, Prof, I know, uh, you, you know, you do a whole lot of different things. So how do you introduce yourself to people? Because you also got a PhD and you're a professor and you do big data and analytics. As Andy runs a lot, ladies and gentlemen. He's a runner of note we discovered so, today. So let's start with the, the interesting part first, right? Is that I'm probably half the man I used to be. Um, and that's because of running, I'm saying, right? <laughs> Just so we all care about that. Um, but thanks for that, Aki. So what do I think the core here is tech is tech, but there has to be the data element, your digital footprint that sits there, and someone needs to make sense of that to enable and disrupt business. Uh, and, and that's where my core sits specifically. At Gibbs, I, I also lecture in the space of data. Second most hated person, as Nomonde will tell you, I teach stats. So still in the data space, but then there's also an underpinning of how does the technology play a role. And that's my big view or my big role here at Gibbs specifically. At Gibbs. Fantastic. Right, so let's get to the, uh, the meat of this conversation. Is technology in business a disruptor or is it an enabler? Pragashni. You know, so I'd have to say that everyone here knows that BC, before COVID, mm. we took life for granted. Yes. And during COVID, overnight, we went digital. Everything from schools to universities to your Pilates classes, people became uh, self-proclaimed master chefs overnight, baked a lot of banana bread. Um, I do believe that in terms of being an enabler, what we did get to see was that we became dependent and had a lifeline through digital, just purely through using, for instance, um, ordering of your medication online, food, yes. basics. You know, things that originally were known for frivolous activities. When you were bored, you went online, you shopped, you bought shoes, you had things delivered. But your life was actually enabled in so many ways because your touch point to the outside world was actually through digital means. You were using Teams, Zoom, and you, know, you were actually connecting with other people. But you also realized that the people that connected you to the outside were, you know, people like delivery people, sanitation workers, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then you got to appreciate life on a different level. And I think all of us had to take stock of an appreciation of, despite stringent COVID protocols and the lockdown rules that were in place, life went on. Yeah. And I think that was actually a true uh, movement towards catalyzing the way that we see technology and digital going forward, because you know, the fourth industrial revolution was something that was meant to gently unravel. But right. what happened was, it suddenly happened. It had a jarring impact, but it made us look at technology in a completely different light. So I do definitely see it as being an enabler. We do obviously have moments where it is a disruptor, but in a way that's going to move you in a direction that's going to shape and mold the future. Fantastic. And you know, it's interesting you say that. It's, it's kind of difficult to believe that it's going to be nearly three years at this, uh, mm -hmm. that we've been in this kind of mode that we're in today. And I shudder to think what would have happened if this pandemic had hit us 10 years ago, sure. right? Yeah. Where the cloud wasn't the mature mm -hmm. state that it was today. And uh, mm -hmm. I guess many of the things you're talking about wouldn't have been possible 10 years ago. But uh, from your point of view, Nomonde, what is, what do you, how do you see technology in business? Is it a disruptor or is it an enabler? I would say it's both. Um, and the reason why I'd say that is in the world of technology, we're always looking to do things faster, easier. Yes. And um, you, you mentioned cloud just now. So I suppose from a data center point of view, we're all looking to shrink you know, the space that we occupy in data centers and migrate to, to the cloud. Um, but I guess in financial services, it will always be like a hybrid model because you can't completely be in the, cl in, in the, cl in the cloud, rather. But the, the challenges that brings, right, is that the complexity of choice creates vulnerabilities and expands the level of inequality that then exists. Right. So you move from like 
one low point of maturi uh, maturity as it relates to the disparities that technology can also make violently apparent to all of us. And I think all of us saw it. Um, and you, 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 you spoke about lockdown, when we were all locked down. The 1% in this country was able to proceed and pivot. You know, your kids were, you know, I'm sure everyone who's sitting and gives here today, your kids probably go to private school, um, which, which is not a bad thing. I'm not throwing shade. I'm part of that group. But in that, I think what it forced a lot of us to do is to recognize our privilege yes. in that moment because Sorry. our kids had access to tools that where they can continue learning online. But the majority of South Africans, I think it's important to bring this into the room. Like we are living in a country that is the most unequal society in the entire world. And that made violently clear just how many people were left out as a result of that. And bringing it back to what we're going to talk about here today, which is your small to medium sized enterprises, a lot of them were not able to pivot. So we speak about how we were able to pivot to hybrid working. That requires investment, it requires money. It wasn't a, you can just call an MNO like a Vodacom or an MTN to say, listen, all my staff must now move to working from home. It wasn't that simple for someone who from a government point of view, your invoices don't get paid on time if you're an entrepreneur. So you are literally living hand to, to, to mouth. And as someone who's married to an entrepreneur, um, it's not that simple. You must pay your staff first before you actually pay yourselves. And these are things we don't you know, always consider when we sit in our comfortable office spaces and you make these calls and decisions around pivoting. Because even from a financial services point of view, I guess the decisions that were made in order to, and kudos to financial services, to try and buffer individuals who were not um, able mm. to make payments at a point in time. But even that buffering was prejudicial because you looked at people who had a good payment history, mm. not necessarily individuals who were struggling to necessarily pay, mm. pay their bills. So that disparity in a system which already does not, we, we say we want to foster entrepreneurship, but do we really want to foster entrepreneurship? Because it's very difficult if you're starting out and you don't have a baseline to get funding in this country from banks also. So never mind you know, the government entities because I'd like us to call ourselves to account because more often than not, we don't have these conversations because they're not comfortable conversations to have. But... Um, Startup capital is not easy in this country. And I'm speaking as a South African, so maybe it's easier somewhere else with regards to angel funding. But um, I'm saying it's an enabler and a disruptor both at the same time. Because for the people who were hard hit by, by COVID, those of us who were in tier one organizations who had access to, to capital were able to pivot, were able to digitize and fast track on your book of work, the initiatives that were going to help your business grow revenue, even though you didn't have people physically in the office. There's a lot of businesses which have shut down mm. because they could not leverage the very same technology, which became increasingly expensive. Because if we look at the share price of MNOs and how well they have done yeah, yeah. in a season where everybody else was bleeding, it tells a story. But I, I don't believe, as, as technologists, it's a story that we must be proud of because we also need to look at how we actually should be making sure that access to technology is not restricted to like a set few of people, but that people who ordinarily would not have access, how do we sit collectively and say, how do we actually solve for this problem? Because we know we need to build entrepreneurs in this country. We must. I mean, our dear president once told us it's not his responsibility to create jobs. Yeah. I mean, that's debatable. He did come back and apologize. But the point is, He's not entirely wrong because we've got a collective responsibility to ensure that we actually trigger that industry and make sure that people win because entrepreneurs create employment in a system where we're stagnated and we're not seeing growth necessarily. We should actually play our part as technologists around how do we help to make sure that we close the gap. We can't sit on the sidelines and pretend that we are not creating disparities in the market. So we need to actually get to a point of making sure that technology is more accessible. So it's definitely an yeah. enabler and a disruptor at the same time. But so, so many interesting points you raise there because absolutely we're all talking from a place of privilege because mm -hmm. we're, uh, we are um, you know, representing big corporations and the big corporations told you during COVID you know, what became impossible soon became impossible. The banks could uh, you know, just send out laptops to all the staff. Mm -hmm. and the reality is small businesses couldn't do that. Yeah. And the more you talk about uh, the cost of doing business, the more things like the cost of uh, communication becomes a big issue in this country. But AJ, you uh, a lot of what Normandy was saying was resonating with you over there. 
Absolutely. Um, I think Namonda is, I share Namonda's views firstly, right? That I think the way in which you implement technology can be either a disruptor or an enabler, right? right. And so let's just take some examples, right? Um, you know, Teams or Zoom or, you know, just online meetings has shrunk the world um, to the point where I could have a discussion with a VC in the US um, or our client in Saudi Arabia um, and at z almost zero cost to us, right? Mm. right? So I think that's a good example of how, you know, technology and the adoption of technology becomes an enabler, right? Equally so, it's a disruptor, right? So if you take the tourism sector as an example, right? I mean, the impact that South African tourism faced in light of COVID lockdowns, you know, the, nobody decimated, traveling, mm -hmm. decimated completely the decimated, yeah. right? But if I look at it today, and maybe it's probably two years too late, right? West Grove's just launched Cape Town in the metaverse, okay? Now, for me, that's how you can change something which is completely disruptive mm -hmm. into an enabler, right? We can expose kids from the DRC or from South America or from the US for that matter to the wonders of Table Mountain and Robben Island by putting some virtual reality goggles on there, right? And I think that's why I say that technology can be both an enabler and a disruptor. So let's talk a bit about our experiences, right? Um, so we developed an autonomous retail checkout solution. Um, in other words, you'd walk into a store, use your phone to scan the barcodes of items you want to buy. We'll give you a dynamic promotion based on your past purchasing history. So it's no longer spray and pray advertising, it's hyper-personalized marketing. Um, and it's contactless, cashless retail checkout, right? Um, Is this like uh, similar to the Amazon store they've got? In very Seattle? similar, okay. except that you use your own mobile phone and you yes. can adopt it in any retail environment today without having expensive cameras and so forth that track you. I value my privacy uh, a lot, so I don't quite like facial okay. recognition, etc. cetera. Um, but I think what was interesting for us is that we came about this idea in hard lockdown. So, you know, like level five lockdown, right? right? You couldn't open your front gate and go out onto the streets just for those that forgot what level five was. That's, that's when family meeting was the trending series that's right. on television at the time. And we went from ideation to MVP in eight weeks. That's sure, that's impressive. Okay, eight weeks. In hard lockdown, I hadn't met the technical guys that were building the hardware, the software guys that were developing the app. None of us had physically gotten together. We spoke for hours on Teams, believe me, right? But I think as a small business, your ability to react quicker is your key differentiator. And I think, you know, when I think about large corporates and how long they take to implement mm. anything, you know, yeah. it'll take them, you know, three weeks to determine the project name. Mm. Um, and they'll have meetings upon meetings to decide on that. Please don't look at the bank people. <laughs> when you're so no, I wasn't looking yet. I was looking at you. Okay. Um, so, so that's the benefit that I think small and medium sized businesses have. And I think it's your ability to capitalize on those advantages that makes you, you know, unique and different, right? And so I always say to, to, to people that come um, and, and, you know, like we employ people from the townships, youth from, unemployed youth from the townships and exposing them to some of the greatest technology in the world. And I say to them, your biggest disadvantage is that you're a hustler. You come from the townships, you understand what it's like to live a hard life. How do you turn that disadvantage to your biggest advantage? And I think in, for small and medium-sized businesses, they need to adopt that frame of mind mm -hmm. that says, actually, I don't have deep pockets. I don't have working capital lying around. Mm -hmm. I've got to hustle my way through, develop something, and take it global. Okay. Interesting. Uh, and what about you, Prof. Shiba? Um, 
let's look at business and, uh, and, and uh, is it a disruptor, is it an enabler? And I want to ask you, like, if you look at, for example, Uber, when Uber started 15 years ago, was technology then a disruptor for Uber or was it an enabler? Because today it would clearly be an enabler, but at the time it was a disabler, a, a, a disruptor. A hundred percent, Aki. And I think just, just before we get there, I think what we must appreciate is technology enables disruption. Mm. And so when we think about it from a big business perspective, we think about it from a medium business and then large businesses, I think large businesses predominantly look at it as how can it enable me to improve efficiency, productivity, those nice big things. But for the small and medium, it's how do I get my foot into the door? Yeah. How do I achieve scale? So let's just take AJ as an example here. He's a South African company sitting at the bottom tip of Africa doing business in the Middle East, raising money from the US in a space of 45 minutes to an hour. Now, what that does not only shrinks the world, but it gives us an opportunity. So given the constraints that Namonde had spoken about, there's the other side to it as well, right? Which we must acknowledge is we, the world becomes smaller, your market size becomes bigger. Yeah. But balance that with more competition now. Mm. So now you've got more competition, which means that your quality of delivery has to be there. Mm. If there's one thing we know, for many of us sitting in the South African landscape, sub-Saharan Africa, we talk a lot. Rich coming from a lecture, but we talk a lot, but we don't deliver all the time. Now we're competing at a global stage. The gig economy still works. Mm. The gig economy works. So what do we need to get involved in the gig economy here? And I'm going to talk about not a small business, but an individual. Right? And I think if we're going to talk about entrepreneurship, we must start individually, then start building up to, the, to becoming employing others. But if we, if we start at that level of an individual, what tools do I need? I need access to a computer, a phone, and I need access to the internet. So those two basic ingredients, the time is there already. What he said, Aki and, and everyone here, is how do we use the internet? Government's given us free access, 25, 50 megs, whatever it may be. Well, the stats show us. Mm, what do we use it for? <laughs> I, I'm not allowed to say that in a public space, right? I can say it. You can yeah, say we it. We can say it. Yes. <laughs> so it's, it's all the stuff. So you can go out and you can look. So I think what, what we've got to sit with here, I think when we talk about entrepreneurship, is number one, acknowledge we don't have a culture of risk taking. Absolutely. That's, that's got to start off basically here. Then our adoption, basically, from you and I sitting in this room here, you and I are not risk takers. I will only catch the Uber once someone has told me it is safe to catch. Can you see that? It's not sitting where we come from, let's call it Southeast Asia, where people are willing to try something new the moment it lands, right, Aki? Right. And so those become barriers that we often forget about. We, in my view, I think we focus too much on the Ubers and the platform economies and all of that nice stuff that exists out there without understanding those are endpoints, and what leads us to those endpoints? We talk about Uber, we talk about Alibaba, we talk about all of those platform businesses, and we all know, loss making until when? Mm. Until they control the payment. Mm. The payment and the transaction, the person who controls the payment and transaction and platform economy makes money. Mm. That's why the banks have to go that route, right? Mm. Now to leverage that and get that scalability is not as easy. You're starting from ground zero where the technology doesn't exist collectively. You've got to pull the pieces together now. And so when we talk about it being a disruptor or an enabler, what we've got to understand is do we have the ingredients to make it an enabler? I think for big business, definitely an enabler. Small to medium businesses are disruptor to actually keep big business on their toes because that's the idea here, right? We've seen the rise of fintech. Mm -hmm. which has really come in. And what we're seeing is the complete opposite, as my colleague Abdullah will tell you, is we're starting to see disintermediation. And disintermediation is I don't need to provide every service mm -hmm. that someone needs from a bank. I need to provide one piece and people will adopt it because they use this thing here. Mm -hmm. How many of us actually see how much time we spend on this thing called the, you know, our smartphones? It's shocking, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, even it's, it's damaging our health. So. But Aki, to the point of is it a disruptor or enabler, I think you've got to be careful at an individual level, enabler to enable you to disrupt, small business, disruptor that enables you, medium disruptor that enables, big business, enabler. And that's because business is chasing the, the productivity efficiency equations.
right? Right. Your problem at with with the small and medium is unfortunately we don't build enough runway, yeah. mm. and and that doesn't give us the opportunity to think, mm. um, and the ability we always reactive whether the it's before COVID, during COVID, I'm going to call this period post-COVID, even though someone told me there's another wave coming, I don't want to believe them for now for obvious reasons. Uh, but I think the point here is that business has learned a big lesson. And I think we've all learned a lesson here, is that stability in the world doesn't exist, right? It's easy for us to talk about the fourth industrial revolution. Northern Hemisphere is already in five IR. So what's happening is we, we're seeing this widening of this gap. So by the time we get on to selling a product or service online, we're lagging already. Yeah. What we lack is, I'm going to blame us as individuals here. We've got connectivity. Let's not put the, uh, the blame at government. They've given us. How do we use it is, the, is what we must reflect on. Um, and and I'm not I don't want to say I'm taking government side, but I think we must balance the view, right? And and say we've got these. Smartphone penetration is there, but the cost of being able to connect on my mobile data, because I I mean we, we speak from privilege here, right? Mm. Yes. But I I spent I think in the last two weeks a thousand five hundred rand just on mobile data, because my data on my my phone had run outside to top up a thousand five hundred rand. And that was, you know, to do some calls and all of that. And I think today I got an SMS to tell me, you've got less than a gig left, right? But 1,500 Rand is much, I can still say, all of us can afford it here, but that's food on a table for three months yeah. at a minimum for many people. Now, if you're tossing out food versus mobile data, that's our problem. Absolutely. We've got to be able to get the basics right. Number one, connectivity. Number two, we need examples to show people this is how you use things. Because by default, we run away and we do the things we're not supposed to. We were all naughty children here. Yes. None of us can say we were, we've always been good. Mm. So I think, Aki, just from that place, Uber, 15 years ago, it was a disruptor. Well, now it enables us. I often ask people, especially when I'm here at Gibbs, how many of you are really catching a Rose's taxi? Now, I'm Ubering. I mean, I don't even have a car now. What do I do? I Uber. Right? Yeah. But, but that's, it becomes a way of life. But that's the natural evolution as people adopt tech. It's a natural evolution. We yeah. don't care what time I WhatsApp you, what time I send you an email. That stuff is all lost. Mm. But I am fearful, both to what Nomande is saying, is that this digital divide has split society up into the haves and the have-nots. That, that's a given. The gap became wider because of COVID. Yeah. The reality has hit us all. Unemployment sits, let's be honest with each other, close to 60% for youth, yeah. right? So six out of 10 people are youth are unemployed. We've got a, a youthful population that is not getting the experience that is required. How many companies that sit here, whether you're small, medium, or large, if an unemployed person wants to get hold of you, where do they send their CV if they don't have connectivity? Mm. Look, clearly we've got quite a few challenges, as you've all highlighted over here, and of course that gap is, is shifting. But, you know, I, I, am seeing, I am seeing some green shoots, okay? Um, you know, we need to look at uh, the undersea cables and the investments that have been made. You know, Google, Facebook, each have invested over a billion dollars. These cables have just landed in South Africa. You look at the investments that have been made in data centers, for example, across the continent. Uh, I look at a continent of 1.4 billion people, but we must all remember one thing that, and, and sometimes we, we kind of shield ourselves in this bubble here in South Africa, but we're actually part of the continent. Mm. And less than 50 over 50% of the continent haven't experienced the internet. Mm. And then the next three to four years, we expect, we're expecting around three to 500 million people to access the internet for the first time. I mean, that's, mm. that is massive. It's, it's like a third of the continent that is going to access the internet for the very first time in the next few years. So what are we doing as a country? What are we doing as businesses? What should we be doing to really uh, foster a culture in small and medium-sized businesses? You touched on the, uh, the, the, the employment. How many people have actually got student training programs? that are taking people. You look at the skills shortage in the tech space in South Africa. You know, organizations cannot fill spaces in organizations, but yet we still talk about these small, medium-sized businesses because that's an integral part of unlocking 
this enabler in technology. Okay, sorry, I just have to react to that because anyone sitting here, whether they did a tech undergraduate or anything, yeah. will tell you those skills are obsolete already. Absolutely. Mm. Right? So this is the, the positive side. The green shoot is that technology is moving so quickly is that there's opportunity. Yes. There's opportunity. If everyone who's sitting here is not continually learning, mm. you're done. The half-life of a skill is now down to five years. In other words, what you learned five years ago is almost obsolete right now. So that gives us all an opportunity, including these young individuals. Mm -hmm. We see, you know, there's, there's coding programs, mm -hmm. they, there's online courses, free, mm -hmm. right? And, and so we're just not seeing people take that up. That's my biggest concern, mm -hmm. is we are not grabbing the bull by the horns and saying, this seems to be the next big thing. I keep hearing about something called cloud. Mm -hmm. Like, what is it? Yeah. Like you, you know, you spoke about many years ago. I was interviewed by, by a journalist a few years, quite some time back, probably about eight years ago. And I'll never forget, I was sitting here at Gibbs, and they talked, we started talking about the cloud. And I quickly picked up that they thought the cloud was the cloud. Yeah, literally. <laughs> now, you fast forward eight years. The point is, you fast forward eight years, everyone's like, yeah, we know what the cloud is, right? But that thing moves. It changes. What's the next big thing? AI, mm. I can tell you, nah, from the 1950s we knew about it. Aki, we're still learning. Yeah. Right? And, and that means anyone here can get involved in it, mm. provided that they're willing to spend some time. Mm. And that tech is changing so quickly that we've got to take advantage of it, those green shoots you're mm. speaking about. Um, but there has to be the enablers in place. Absolutely. Well, for IR, guess what? We don't have three IR, more than <laughs> half the people in the on the continent don't have access to the internet. What is the third eye in industrial revolution? The internet, right? Second yeah. industrial revolution, electricity, guys. Yeah. Basics. We can talk about four and five and six. Yeah. Can we get two and three right? Yeah. That's what we need. Yeah. 100%. So, so panel, how do, we, yeah. how do we address this issue? Where do, how do we move forward? You know, you, you spoke, oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> you spoke, you know, about lear, like this youthful population that is not being um, employed. And I think historically, tech is seen, or let's call it like your STEM subjects is seen as I must study mathematics, I must do science, you know, in, in university in order to be able to get into a BSc. And like Manoj, you know, has alluded to, that's not necessarily true in this day and age. You don't need that. I think your, your ability, your analytical ability can help you code. Doesn't mean that you would have necessarily needed to study mathematics. You could have done history. Um, but kids can actually get into coding programs and become devs, mm. which is a skill that is required worldwide. It's not yet, I don't think any company is able to fill the development capability that's actually required. Um, so we also need to you know, change the narrative out there with regards to the fact that this sector is a scary thing that no one can actually come into. It's such an exciting sector, and I think it needs to start at school where we teach kids how to code from school, so that interest is actually there even from primary school. But there's other issues, again, that we also need to appreciate in terms of our education system as well, which needs work, and all of us need to contribute. I don't even think that universities can write curriculums fast enough with regards to the exponential change that's happening in the technology sector. I think Singularity has tried, right, to, to try and anticipate skills of the future and how you then upskill people. Mm. But we don't have a Singularity in South Africa, as, as an, or in Africa, let's call it Africa, Aki, because mm. you spoke about the continent. But that's really, from an, even an, an educational perspective, that's how we should be thinking. Because we don't know the skills that we are going to require two years from now, three years from now. I don't even think, you know, we, we've even, on the cloud journey that we're talking about, AWS, so Amazon and Microsoft try in terms of creating programs to teach cloud skills. But universities have not necessarily caught up with, with that. That's how fast these things are changing. So they've seen a gap in the market, they capitalize on it, and then they try and upskill. But the, the trick to that is, Am I your cloud provider? If I am your cloud provider, I will then give you licensing. It excludes many in that process because then you're upskilling people who are already in the system. And then we lose out on, on young people who are not in the system. Another criticism that I'd like to give to ourselves, because it's always important to actually do internal work, 
when these young people land in our businesses, what do we do with them? They could have gone and done their free coding. They would have done this amazing stuff, gone through AJ's program that has taught them the importance of bringing your entrepreneurial thinking into opportunities because you'll, you'll run. Now, here's this young person, ambitious, wants to learn, wants to add value, make a difference. You send them to make photocopies. <laughs> or coffee. It, they, because now you don't have the time to sit and teach. But all of us have a responsibility to lift as we rise. It can't be that we complain about young people not having employment, but none of us are going to take the time to spend even one hour in a week with a young person to show them the work that you are doing. It's a collective responsibility of all of us to actually fix it. Because it's true, there are free programs. And there are those who don't take up those opportunities, but there are those who do. And those who do, we hurt them. There are young people who come into a system, we forget about them. And they get disheartened. And then, with the hustler spirit, let me set up my own business. You get there, there are no pro your 15 megs or however megs it might be, that are your free allocation. It's not going to help you with a call to LA. It's not long enough for you to actually make that phone call and to pitch if you need to. You don't have capital to get on a plane, even if you're shortlisted in a competition you've entered, to actually get to Silicon Valley to pitch your amazing idea. Usually, it's unicorns who get that opportunity to do that. So I, I encourage all of us to self-reflect. All of us have learners and students in our organizations. We can't say we don't have graduate programs, or even internships and learnerships. All of us have it. But if you check yourself, have you spent time with those individuals to help them? Yeah, but the thing is that, you know, it's so interesting we're having this conversation. I'm reflecting, listening to all of us. And every kind of panel that I, uh, I facilitate with regards to this, we all talk about the same thing. And we spoke about the same thing two years ago and three years ago. And tonight we're sp talking about small, medium-sized businesses. And yes, technology is the enabler, et cetera. We know all of this. But we, what, are, what are other nations doing? Who, who has actually got it right? Has South Korea got it right? Has China got it right? Has the US got it right when, it, when, when they look at nurturing these small and medium-sized businesses? Like in the US, for example, if you fail, you get up and you do mm. this again. If you fail in South Africa, you're gone. You did. Mm. So um, you, 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 this system doesn't allow you to fail. So who is getting it right? Perhaps we need to take that as a blueprint and apply it here in South Africa. Okay, let me challenge you on that, right? I mean, I think that the days of cut and paste, I think, are over, right? I think we have a unique set of challenges in this country. Right. We can't get the basics right. Mm. Electricity, I mean, you know, <laughs> we were included in a a Silicon Valley Accelerator program last year. And the, the founders of this Accelerator program said to us, you know, the thing that we have going for us is perseverance. That you can have four hours or six hours of load shedding in a day mm. and you can still create something which is world-class, competitively priced with all these barriers that if you're in the valley, they don't understand load shedding, right? It's a, it's a concept which is completely foreign. Europe, for the first time, will start to understand come winter what load shedding is, right? I want to see how VCs and startups in Europe react. Mm. Okay, so I think we have something which is built or baked into our DNA. Perseverance. I don't think we give ourselves enough credit for how much we persevere. So the first thing I think is a unique set of challenges. We need to hold government accountable. We all, every single one of us, need to hold government accountable. I'm sure most of you, like me, pay my taxes and so forth. We pay rates and taxes. And... You know, when I look at the potholes, and I, it's just all of these factors count against us. When you're trying to get to a meeting or, you know, and you have a blown out tire because you eat a pothole, right? Mm -hmm. So all of these things, I think we have a collective responsibility around. The second thing I think is, we're not touched on it. We have this handout mentality 
which needs to come to an end. When I look at the rest of the continent, mm. there's a sense of opportunity abundance, which we don't have. Mm. We look around us, we see the potholes, and then we expect what's a dial direct and discovery to create the opportunity to somebody to fill those potholes, mm. right? Actually, there's opportunities wherever we look. We need to be more entrepreneurially inclined to take advantage of the opportunities that all the shortcomings that government and the private sector actually place in front of us, the opportunities to address that. And then the last thing that I want to say is that, you know, I think corporates in this country have a moral obligation to give young startups opportunities. And so we need to create smart ecosystems where large corporates, small startups, you know, graphic designers, the gig economy guys, we, we create these smart ecosystems that allows us to leapfrog the rest of the world. Mm. Okay? Because if we don't do that, we forget ever, in 10 years now we're going to be sitting here same having the thing. same discussions yeah. and the same debates. Right, right. Look, I think that uh, you, you raise some valid points. I, I think that we often criticise government, um, rightly so, but unfairly so in some circumstances. And, I, and, I, and I'm looking at the, at, the, at the corporates in this room, you know, and, and I challenge corporates. Who's here in a corporate environment? Can I have a show of hands who's in a corporate environment? In your particular corporate environment, how many young graduates that have finished high school have you taken in your environment to teach them some sort of entrepreneurial skill? Imagine if every organization was, uh, you know, was mandated to mm. take on a percentage of, let's say, if you're a billion dollar, a billion rand company, you have to take X amount of people, take them through some sort of a program, entrepreneurship. Imagine we start rolling out these kind of people in the industry, whether it's graphic designers, you know, uh, security specialists, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what a difference it would make into the economy. So I think we also have to look at ourselves and, and reflect on ourselves and ask, what are we doing? What are we doing as individuals in this room mm. to make sure that um, we are looking at small, medium-sized businesses? Because if those, if that sector fails, mm. everything comes Absolutely. collapsing down after that. Mm. Um, so at this point, um, please, if you want to ask a question, just raise your hand, press that button and we will take your question. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to add anything to the conversation. Um, you haven't said much, uh, <laughs> but I'll you're share. in agreement. Uh, <laughs> but if anybody has anything you want to add to what we've been discussing, but I think it's a, it's a very complex issue. Mm -hmm. uh, prof Racha. Not a prof. <laughs> Okay, I just want to do a, uh, you know, position a question. I just made you a prof tonight. Just take, uh, you know, take it. This is the SMB series, and uh, you've got uh, small, medium-sized businesses. We've spoken quite a bit about the ecosystem. I wanted to maybe ask the panel, as an entrepreneur, if I want to, you know, utilize technology to be able to enable my business. I'm thinking about e-commerce. I'm thinking about digital marketing. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about how analytics enables my business. What are some of the practical ways I could go about thinking of the role of technology, as Manoj has said, as an enabler? It's a great question. And, and of course, you know, it's all been democratized right now, right? So uh, these small, medium-sized businesses have the same access to the technologies mm. as the big corporates do. But how do they tap into those resources? I'm happy to okay. give this a stab. Um, you know, <laughs> the one thing that we learned as a startup is you beg, borrow, and almost steal, right? Um, so we lean on a lot of people that we know in our networks, right? And, and I'm fortunate. I'm fortunate because I have social capital. And I think the vast majority of people in our country lack social capital. So I think that's one important thing that we need to build, firstly. But secondly, Abdullah, to come to your, your you know, there are so many tools that are readily available, right? So I, I, I use Fiverr extensively, right? So when I need something done, let me tell you, they, you'll be amazed at what you can do for a dollar, okay? 
or five dollars or ten dollars, right? So I think that as a small business, as a startup, what you need to do is, is stretch your rand as far as you possibly can. And you start off by leveraging social capital first, mm -hmm. failing which, if you have to pay for something, you pay, for, uh, you pay as little as possible for as much as you can get. Yeah. And you milk that thing, right? As far as you can. As far as you can. <laughs> because again, that's, in my view, baked into our DNA, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. When you're in the townships and you're hungry, you stretch that loaf of bread for as much as you can get out of it, right? The bologna tastes better, mm. you know, <laughs> when you've had it three days in a row, okay? Yeah. So, believe me, we, we have these inherent traits that we don't leverage enough. And that's what I think we need to do, right? Um, use the freemium model, right? Like use the tools, get the basics, but learn. The most important thing that we need to do is Google is your best friend as a startup. Not yeah. the company, the, the actual... search engine. <laughs> <laughs> I have to agree because there's many open source technologies that are out there that I don't think we leverage enough because when you are an entrepreneur, you want to be seen as a professional. Right. So you want to be seen you know, with tools that people would recognize and not to use the freemium model that is actually there. I think it's, it's just a thing of like, I want to, it's keeping up appearances, I think, that uh, some of our South African entrepreneurs think they have to do. Like, I, I, and then you get into a spiral of debt because you really can't afford the licensing that comes with your paid for services that all of us know necessarily will use Microsoft as an example. Your license expires, you haven't been able to pay someone for the website that's been built. When there are tools that provide you access to doing these things yourself, I absolutely agree you should sweat your assets, you shouldn't like um, occupy space or like buy space. You, your address should be your office. But a lot of the time we really want to keep up appearances because we assume it's going to attract money. Make money rest will follow afterwards. And actually tap into your, your, your social capital. I absolutely agree with that. Like call a friend. And I would encourage women to do this a lot. I'm a woman on this panel, I can't not talk about mm. that. Um, I want more women in technology, so I have to talk about this, there is an issue. Um, so ask is like, I'm going, I'm yes, diverting. No, no, but like, um, also even if you look at, even from a JSC point of view, how many women are sitting in JSC listed companies in this country, it's a problem. Um, and it gets worse now when you enter into uh, sectors which are predominantly meant for women. Now female entrepreneurs in this country um, also need to leverage social capital, and we don't, because we just assume that I must show I'm excellent, and then after I show I'm excellent, everything will follow. That's not how it works. Yeah. So I encourage all of us to tap into systems of people that you know. Even if it's an email and someone you've met, remind me. Remember that day I met you, ever, ever, this is what I'm, I'm looking for. All of us say that we want to employ, what is it, level one companies, because we get more points, and then you become a level one um, provider. And your highest points are your points with women-led mm businesses where ownership is, is, is with women. And I stand here not just as a black woman, I'm an advocate of all women because there aren't enough of us in the world to actually be able to say that I, I stand just for black women, I don't. I say this on behalf of all women, we can't afford to compete. So if there are women who are in business, you need to pull a sister up with you and make sure that they, they win. And this is also to the men in the room who are advocates and allies. I encourage you to help our sisters as well and make sure that they win because you're probably far ahead um, than somebody else who's just starting out. And there's knowledge that you can pass on to actually help those entrepreneurs win. Sometimes it's just teaching people how to hustle better and to tap into networks where ordinarily they would not because they don't know people. I'll pause it. Manoj. <laughs> So I'd just like I... to add something, sorry. No, I will be Manoj. No, no. I want to be Manoj. Manoj, <laughs> you just wait for your sorry. <laughs> so I think in terms of a recommendation is that what I've found is small business very often does not think about aggregating their efforts in terms of trying to get venture capitalists interested in what they're trying to offer. What they try and do is they run the, the, this whole race by themselves. 
Now, if you have to have amalgamation of various businesses that are now going to pull together, similar industries, similar um, challenges, you're far more likely to get that attention that you're going to require. Because unfortunately, we live in a society where you need to search for information. Yes, it's available, but you need to know what to look for. You need to know that there are associations out there mm. and you know, that do support startups. Startups have become the buzzword of today. And something That's else true. that you need to be aware of as well is that as much as we can um, you know, uh, say that certain things don't work in South Africa, um, government has actually been um, you know, a strong advocate for small businesses backing them, making sure that, you know, in terms of various startups, how do we facilitate that journey? And the thing is, I think we need to actually, you know, shine the spotlight on those types of efforts so that we get onto that, you know, specific track as well. Because the thing is, from a small business perspective, if you're not consistently staying at the forefront of whatever industry that, you know, you are, um, you'll become just a shadow. Mm. Yeah. You know? mm. a lot become of it, irrelevant. Mm. Yes, Absolutely. and you yeah. need to actually, you know, take the power of harnessing whatever is available and, you know, try and get that attention uh, spotlighted so that you can get investment into your business. Because I think um, a misconception with any small business is that you need to use your own capital. Not necessarily, mm. you know. So it's just, I think, to um, possibly just think down a different road. So, Abdullah, I think you ask a very important question, and I think for me, it starts off with, and you and I have had this conversation around, what skills and resources do I have? What skills and resources do I need? Bridged social network. And that, that social network comes in the form of, we all know our social networks that we're on, and you can, you can, there's always reaching out, right? And then there's the, the thinking. You know, I, I'll use this example because I think it's, it's a good example personally is that you actually don't need coding skills to deploy a chatbot. Mm -hmm. You've got an e-commerce website, Absolutely. you don't need coding skills to do mm -hmm. that. The first time I came across block-based coding was with Brett, your, your, your company, iStore, right? And I said, I said, let me have a look at this thing. And, and block-based coding is, is as simple as putting Lego together and you learn by doing. Well, that's exactly how we build chatbots. It's exactly how we've democratize the ability to get fancy things, AI-powered chatbots out, mm. by dragging and dropping. That doesn't require a big skill. It just requires you to say, I'm gonna go and look at a network, I'm gonna ask people, hey, do you know something about mm. chatbots, AI-powered ones? Ajay says, yeah, why don't you just go and have a look at this thing? It takes him two minutes to advise you, in three hours you've got a chatbot live on your website that works better than most companies right. who spend millions of rands on it, right? Mm. So it's, it's, it's about, I think, understanding what you have, skills and resources. Every one of us has a set of skills and resources. And when we talk, think about it ourselves, I think we, we often say, we pull ourselves down. That's a big problem that we have. So we're not confident enough. Aki, you are asking, is there any model in the world that we could copy paste you. And I think it's the model of confidence that mm. we see coming out of the West specifically. Mm. I promise you, the person in the West will know nothing about artificial intelligence, but the way they speak about hey. it, you. <laughs> yes. I, I feel like, you, you know, but you understand, it's confidence, yeah. right? <laughs> Sometimes we just lack simple things as confidence. And, and then we, you know, we become meek and we become mild, but it's saying, I, I've got this. I'm just, you, 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 those, 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 those video clips are available on YouTube. Mm. You just needed a sense of direction from your social network. Yes. Mm. We can knock on whether it's going to be whichever social network you're going to use to get access to people. Ten, nine out of ten people are, not, are going to ignore you. Well, that's just how the world works, right? To Ajay's point is that we've got something called resilience and perseverance built into us. Mm. Well, then we continue. We keep asking, and it just takes one person to say, you know what, here's a URL, mm. and you're off. What we mustn't do is give up. Mm. Yeah. And I think it's that, that, that mindset that, number one, tech is not difficult. Actually, all of us sitting here will admit, I'll admit it, we sound like we know exactly what's happening in technology. The reality is, guys, it's moving so fast that we haven't been able to keep up. Absolutely. Can we just acknowledge that? Yeah. Absolutely. So we've got to keep learning. How do we learn? I learn personally. I read every week for two hours a week on technology. Mm. That's it. 
right? Just spending two hours a week. So I've got time. When I say I've got time, between 8 and 10 o'clock on a Sunday, a Saturday night, I'm reading about tech. Well, what choices do you make with that 8 to 10, right? Socialize, nothing wrong with socializing, but how do you use your resource? So I think we, we, we've got to understand technology is going faster than humans have been able to adapt to it. Absolutely. Yeah. True. Which oh, means there's opportunity. And it beats and watching Manchester United play. <laughs> no, that, that's a waste of time, right? Yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's the reality, you know, the, the pace at which it's moving. As a small and medium-sized business, is you cannot afford to be stagnant. Absolutely. The moment that you're stagnant, somebody else is going to think of something mm. and find something in mm. technology that's going to unlock value mm. and be an enabler and, and, and uh, overtake what you're doing. And, you know, a great example is just recently with what WhatsApp has announced uh, as a platform to start selling and that sort of thing. I mean, that, mm. that is incredibly powerful, you know, even for a, a small business that's selling, you know, certain niche goods, that is a very powerful enabler. Mm. And it, it, it puts you in the guise yeah. with the 60-60s of the world. And if you've got a unique program, there is a platform that you can use to enable your business. Uh, at this point, I'd love to open the floor. If anybody has a question, yeah, please press that button. We want to get you guys involved and I uh, want to hear your views. And also, um, which small, medium-sized business have you come across in the last 18 months that has blown you away, that has used technology to enable the business to get to another level that it was pre-COVID? Yes, sir. Okay, evening panelists. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for the great discussion. Um, to answer your qu question quickly, uh, I've seen in tech recycling, so to speak, uh, where a company, or actually it's about three companies, very small companies, almost micro startups, um, they, you know, buying second hand tech and then selling it again and teaching users how to use it. Brilliant. Uh, I thought that was quite innovative. And, um, and, and I, I imagine that they're buying this technology at a really affordable rate yeah. and reselling it at an affordable rate. Yeah, yeah. So that's the idea. That's the, I think their mission is to kind of jump into what AJ said about getting more people connected um, to the internet, to smart TVs, to smartphones, etc. Uh, I just thought it was really interactive and I ended up buying some tech from them. Um, my first question is, you know, to touch on what the professor said. And this is, you know, we, we all, I, I wouldn't say all, but most of us have some sort of connection to the internet. And what we do with it is not very productive. How do we get, because I, I've introduced maybe, I'd say 50 people to the Google Africa coding skill course that they have. And it's free, it's available to anyone. If you've got a Google account, you can go ahead and do it. I've done it. Uh, but to get people to do it, actually do it, um, you know, they do the first two chapters and then that's it. They quit. Uh, how do you get the internet not to be a distraction or a disruptor and an enabler instead of a disruptor? So social media, Netflix, it's all online. That's what we usually do. How do we get people to actually adopt a new frame of mind to enable themselves to use technology to add a, a, to add a valuable a, yeah. time. Are you alleging that TikTok is a waste of time? <laughs> 100%. <laughs> I think Ajay can tell you this. Uh, it's called the two-minute rule, right? Mm. Um, we All of us have procrastinated on something. I'm probably one of the biggest. I look at emails and hope they just disappear sometimes, <laughs> right? We've all done that. Well, if, you, if you're ever dreading to do something, just spend two minutes. Just start with it. Just two minutes, that's it. Mm. And if you start your morning on that two minute rule, the rest of your day just gets more and more productive. Mm. So when faced with Aki's choice of TikTok versus a coding thing, let me just start with coding for two minutes. I promise you two hours later, you're, you're done. That's how the human brain works. It's that kickstart. This is what differentiates doers like Ajay from dreamers, right? The dreamers, we just dream all day. Is they actually start, they start, they try. And what has he got built in him? He knows he's going to fail. He knows that. Mm -hmm. When we start for two minutes, we know it's going to be a tough two minutes. But once we're over that two minute, it goes. And, and I promise you guys, it's, it, it's called the two minute rule. Just spend two minutes with something that you have been dreading to do. And all of a sudden it breaks. And, and that's something I found over time. I, and, I've, and I've tested it with a number of people and it just works. So when you're competing for headspace, infinite scroll should not be your default. Your two-minute role should be your default. That's what you're competing for. That's Love what it that. is. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's so interesting you say that, you know, but, but we also, we are all of a different generation over here. Um, when you look at how people are, um, uh, you know, taking technology into your point, uh, you look at Gen Z and you look at millennials today, they're not searching for things like restaurants and advice on Google. They're searching now on places like TikTok. Absolutely. So there in itself perhaps lies another business opportunity that you need to be uh, open enough to address it. But I get where you're coming from, from a distraction point of view. And it's very difficult because, of course, social media is engineered to mm. hook you in and keep you into that. And before you know it, you've been spending half an hour looking at everybody else's mm. updates yeah. uh, on mm. the weekend. I, I, it's a waste of time, yeah. to be honest with you. Um, but you're all nodding because you do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think probably the best recommendation would be almost shaping a new habit for yourself every day. Because yeah. I think, unfortunately, the world we live in, the first thing that everybody does is as soon as they open their eyes, check their phone, mm -hmm. scroll on social media. You're laughing because you know that's what you do. Yeah. <laughs> but AJ, as a small, small medium-sized business entrepreneur, which is what you are, what, is, what, what advice do you give to other small, medium-sized business entrepreneurs in terms of the habits that have made you successful? So I think two or three things, right? One, it really is a mindset shift mm. that is required, right? I spend my first two hours of waking time reading, reading what's happening in the world, whatever, just, just, knowledge, just gaining knowledge, right? First. Secondly, I think you have to exercise, right? I mean, like... The amount of stresses, the amount of rejections I've had from VCs. I have developed such a thick skin, it's not even funny, right? It's, so, so you have to accept that not everybody's going to buy into what you're selling. Mm. Okay? But that doesn't mean that there isn't the one person or the one, I call them the believers, right? There are believers out there that will back you and you speak to any entrepreneur, whether it's Richard Branson or Elon Musk, they will tell you about the one believer that gave them their shot. And that's what you need to find. Out of the seven billion people in this world, you need to find the one believer. Okay? And then lastly, I want to add just to, to, to what you asked, right? I think we need to create far more examples that people look up to and say, actually, if I spend less time, and I'm going to say it because Manoj didn't say it, watching Pornhub, then I think I could be the next Elon Musk, right? Now, as South Africans, I don't think we claim enough credit for creating the Elon Musks of the world. And I think there are a number of examples beyond Elon. Shuttleworth. Shuttleworth. Uh, the, you know, the, uh, there are enough examples, right? I, th I don't think we as a country claim enough credit for producing that, right? So one of the big things that I'm driving is to say, actually, my tech that we built in QHOP is 100% South African technology. And proudly so, right? And I think that's what we've got to start owning, is this collective identity, this collective drive to want to succeed. And I think we must start supporting each other, right? Mm. The other thing we don't do what? is we're all jealous and then we all try and drag everybody else down. Yes. Actually, we need to change that mindset mm. completely. Yeah. I'm okay. tired of it. I'm really tired of it can't be done. It, you know, it'll never work. It came from South Africa. Can it really work, you know? Mm. When Microsoft, the $3 trillion company, believes in me, I have the confidence to go and get the chief data information security officer for Apple to serve on my advisory board, okay? So that's the confidence that you get when you believe in what you do. Mm. Right, I'm going to the floor. There's a, a question at the back over there. Turn on your microphone. Yeah, can you hear me? Cool. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for all the insights. Uh, it's really helpful. Um, so everyone mentions the mindset portion. So how do we actually guide and instill a lot of the growth mindset into into the youth, right? I mean, do we do we disrupt the curriculum? Is that what we need to do? Um, 
No. Take, take your kids out of school. That's the first bit of advice I'll give you, right? I Not mean, that I'm adv advocating. Are, are you <laughs> saying, like, do, do, and I'm, I'm out of the, the, the loop, but do, do kids learn entrepreneurship at no. school? Do they learn how to scale a small business? Do they learn about what we've been talking about at school? Take your kids and ask them to become a packer for a day at Checkers, right? The amount of skills that they will learn in terms of how you deal with people, okay, is more valuable than a year in school, in my opinion, right? My kids have just graduated or finished matric last year, so I, I, I know what they've been taught. Mm. And actually what they've been taught is useless in the real world, okay? So my view around this is 70% or 80% of learning takes place at home. What are you doing to create a learning environment that changes the mindset of your kids? That makes them the next Elon Musk's, right? Mm. Or in my case, the AJ Lalu's. I'm, I'm pretty Yes, right. please, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Love that. Jeez, AJ, you're setting a very bad precedent over yeah. there. <laughs> so, you know? so me, and I love just... the entrepreneurs here sharing a pashmina. That's yes, so I saw that as well. <laughs> well done, ladies. Making I'll be charging, eh? <laughs> right. Uh, any more questions? And then we'll take the one light. One. Here we go, Michelle. Yeah, Michelle. I think that was a perfect intro into my question. Um, so I'm Michelle, and I manage the ISTO activity in the school sector. And um, what I've, uh, so I've got two questions. So one I've seen is that technology is the only way we can scale equity in the school sector, but it also has the biggest danger of creating a huge divide as well. And there's a huge disconnect in between the school curriculum and what you are talking about here. So although, so I really am interested with your experience how, because children need to be in school for various reasons in our country, how, um, <laughs> how, um, how, we, how business can impact the curriculum and how, what what kind of education does our country need and how we with in this room can impact the the curriculum that's my first question and the second question is that we all spoke about the transformation that covid has brought and the amazing things that have happened in covid and just sitting i hate to say after covid because amnesty keeps saying we're not over covid mm. there's still people um suffering from covid is what what are what has has things really changed for good and for uh, have for for the better? So mm. I think those are my two questions. Yeah. Okay, I can. Okay, Manish, go for. So I think this. I think to the question around schooling and the education system, I think where we're making a mistake is that we don't learn maths to do maths. We learn maths for the skill that maths gives us, yeah. mm. which is logical thinking. Mm. Now, what happens in this world if you don't give, teach people, maths is the conduit to logical thinking, right? If we don't teach that, understand the logical thinking doesn't play out in any context that it's applied. Right. So I think we, 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 we flow, we go and we run after subjects instead of what is the underlying mm. skill I'm learning by doing that. Anyone apply Pythagoras' theorem in the last after, you know, 15 years after you finished it? I'm still looking for X, right? Um, it's there, but it's, it's less about that, but how do I solve a problem? That's the problem solving and critical thinking skills that we need. What we focus on is, and, and your medical doctors will tell you, the biology you learn at school doesn't help you become a medical doctor. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It gives you some ways of thinking, and I think that's where we've got to, we've got to start tuning into. The entrepreneurship is trying. Government is trying with schools of specialization, right? At a school level, you can go through to become a chef. You can go and you can, you know, they've got the schools of specialization, which is being trialed here in Gauteng, as far as I understand. And I think they're kicking off as this, this goes through. And so look at skills instead of the subject. That's, that's the first thing. The, the point of Jay, you know, let them go out and apply some of that, when you're learning how to pack a shelf, where I cut my teeth in the retail sector, mm. let me tell you, logic plays a big role. Mm. How do I get this done quickly with the minimal amount of effort, right? And especially when you're, uh, I was big, right? So how do I make sure I preserve the energy even more? <laughs> so, so that's it. And then we come to business, and how do we start applying this in the business context? Well, I think one of the big things that we are missing is these hackathons in some shape or form. 
How do we give people an opportunity on a Saturday morning to come and solve a business problem? Mm. You know, uh, there's the marshmallow challenge. You know, I have done this quite a bit. And it's been proven many times that you do, you just Google the marshmallow challenge, right? And if you've got young children, do it with them. And I can almost bet my bottom dollar, nine out of 10 times, they'll beat you at it. Because the way we think and the way that you do things as, as we as adults, we've fallen into a way of doing things. Younger individuals don't have that. So the problem solving and the innovation comes out of those individuals at a school level. Rolling out the tech at school, the tech is an enabler. What's it enabling? Yeah. Well, let them determine that, right? I think the coding and the block-based coding that you guys do is phenomenal. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that now. I'm going to say without that basic block-based yeah. coding, that's you've killed the barrier immediately. Is it going to give an immediate ROI? Unfortunately not until you get to scale of it. Can a single business do it? No. Oh. And I think it's the fallacy that we have, Apple is doing it, or iStore is doing it. It's not. It's got to be you plus you plus you plus you plus me. And I think that's the way we get scalability. Um, and then we've got to go into places no one's ventured before. That's what we've got to do. We've got to try things that no one has tried before. Because if we're going to do the same things over and over again, we all know what that defines. And so those skills, think about them differently. The role of business, I think we, we may be overthinking of this. How does business mentor small businesses? Big business, big brother, big sister to, to small businesses. We don't need much more. You just need mentorship. And that was something the National Youth Development Agency tried many years ago, but it didn't work, right. right? It wasn't advertised, so people didn't know about it. But imagine you had a mentor. Just imagine that. Mm. I, I didn't have one. Imagine you had a mentor. Imagine every one of you had a mentor here, someone who knew. When AJ, AJ says that he can uh, attract uh, Rick Orloff onto his board, who used to work for Apple and, and you know, chief security officer, well, that's because he sees value in it, but Jay's way of being able to say, so I craft value. So I'm going to use your, your deep skills. It's mentorship, guys. Mm. Prof, it's mentorship. I know we're just running out of time for seven. Did you want to uh, yes. say anything? Yes. Yeah. So I think from an education perspective, um, South Africa has, has actually come a long way. Because if you look at the STEM model of science, technology, engineering, and maths being implemented actively in several schools, it does encourage the technological aspect. Mm. I do think we can leverage the fact that um, children from a young age all the way to teenagers and going into university are in fact screen addicts. We need to leverage that. Try and look at how do you now introduce, for instance, the concept of second life that had come about years ago. You have your physical life and then you've got your parallel universe where you have your so-called second life that you create you build, you learn, you can be an entrepreneur, you can actually shape your entire life there. You need to leverage that. And also I think with gamification having taken off so actively across the world, there's definitely opportunities there to use that as a means to um, embed certain learnings just around technology. Yeah. So try and make the whole learning journey a fun one. Yeah. And join AJ in the metaverse, he's already there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Showing it earlier. Girl, let me just say something, right? I mean. We're on a Get Funded Africa program now. It's run by Microsoft, okay? And there's two things that st stood out for me. One, you know, if we think we have it hard, the rest of the continent has it far worse, yeah. right? Like, just simple things like, you know, getting onto a call or yeah. so, right? Um, and then pitching, right? I mean, like, I think I'm relatively articulate. But, you know, accents and, you know, language is a significant barrier right. on the continent, right? And I think the third thing is we have a very fragmented market. So although the continent is big in terms of numbers, in terms of growth opportunities, I mean, VC capital flowing into the market last quarter was 125% up quarter on quarter, whereas the rest of the world is showing negative growth in terms of VC funds flowing into different yeah. markets from Asia to, to the US, right? So I think Africa is the kind of place to be, mm. right? I think we have many factors that count against us, but I think there are also very much factors that count for us. Yes. We need to capitalize on the things that count for us. Mobile money, FinTech, these are big, big drivers of value growth 
um, attraction of, of, of capital Agriculture, and jobs. Agriculture, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Agriculture. Big, yeah. Agri-tech yeah. is a big space. Well, let's, let, let's wrap this up. And uh, I know it's 7 o'clock. And thank you very much for your participation. And uh, the, the panel will be around, so if you want to engage with us. But let me, let me start off with you sitting up there, um, uh, Abdullah. I mean, it's been a fascinating discussion. But we, what you teach here at Gibbs, for example, are you seeing that... Um, small, medium-sized businesses are being eroded and not growing at the same pace that we are seeing these businesses growing globally. Um, and perhaps we've highlighted some of the problems coming from a school environment where there's no entrepreneurship uh, learnings, etc. cetera. But um, what is your take on what we've discussed and what needs to be done to unlock that value in small and medium-sized businesses? Is it something going back to the school? Is it a combination of what we've been talking about? Are we in trouble? Yeah, I think, it's a, I think it's a fascinating question. It's been lovely just capturing a lot of the discussion today. For me, I think I teach in the area of digital strategy and strategy at school. And I often say we can complicate business or we can go back to the base. The objective of business is to be able to look at how do we create and capture value uh, in the society that we're living in. And so in effect, as a business owner, I've got to think about how do I create value? And when I create that value, what am I going to do to be able to capture that value in manager's perspective, using the skills, the capabilities, the assets that I have in what I'm doing. So often we say businesses do one of two things. They either solve a pain point or they create an opportunity. So you use the example of Uber and you talk about Rose's Taxi. I don't understand and I struggle to contend with why Uber was not created in a market of need like this. Yeah. So if I had a date tonight, I'm happily married, I don't have a date, my wife's at home. <laughs> but let's say hypothetically, I have a date, right? And she was coming to pick me up, she was coming on the Khao train, the Khao train got stuck, she sent me a text, uh, and she said, Abdullah, I can't get you there, can you make your way to mainland, because can we meet there? I didn't bring my car, because I was getting picked up. So what do I do? Uh, before Uber, I had no option. Mm. I had Rose's taxi, let's be honest. I'd call it, they might not hear me. I'd wait an hour and a half. Mm. The guy would pitch up a 1981 beat-up Mercedes-Benz with fur on the dashboard. Um, <laughs> I might not even get to Menland, right? The other option is if I know how to use my hand signals, I've got a fantastic public transport network in a minibus taxi. Mm. But if I don't know how to use a taxi, I've got a problem. I'm not getting to Menland. I'm not getting on that date. This is the market of need. This is where the opportunity was. The problem is, in my view, I think, there isn't an enabling environment. There isn't the interrelationship between big and small business. So we've become very mm. enclave, right? Uh, big business operates on its own, big yes. government operates on its own, small business mm. is operating on its own. How do we create more of that inclusive value chain? How do we share more stories? So Silicon Valley is great because it's got role models. Right. Uh, we need more role models, more mm. people who speak exactly. up, more people like Ajay say, I've got tough skin. I've yeah. been uh, to many doors. They haven't opened, but now I'm doing some fantastic work out mm. in the Middle East. Those are the stories we want to hear, right? And we must amplify them and bring them down, I would say, Aki, in conclusion, to a practical, pragmatic level. How am I creating value? How am I capturing value? And what are the practical ways in which you can do that as well? Um, and let me close with the following. I, in another hat, own a uh, percentage in, a, in, in an auto business. And we've, we struggled with not the big stuff. We struggled with the small stuff. We struggled with stuff that should be quite easy to be able to do. And I'll tell you why that's the case. It's the case because of that ecosystem uh, that comes together. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. And you know, what I'm hearing from you as well is that there are so many opportunities that are staring small and medium-sized businesses directly in the face. And sometimes we, we're wearing these blinkers that we don't want to pull those blinkers off to see them. Like there's no reason like in an informal area that uh, a spaza shop shouldn't have a 60-60 model, hmm? for example. Absolutely. And servicing a community and adding the same efficiencies, right? So wrapping up to my panel this evening, and it's been such a fantastic panel, and just I'm tapping into your minds. What are your closing thoughts on um, you know, businesses and uh, using technology as an enabler with small and medium-sized businesses? It sounds like there are lots of opportunities out there, but what are your takeouts? What are your thoughts as we close this evening? Let's start off with you, Prof. If not you, then who? And I think we must, we've got to take the individual responsibility and, and, and break our mindsets open. Opportunity is out there in all shapes and forms. Just think about infinite scroll versus infinite ability to learn something that you can use. Mm. That's it. Mm. 
How about yourself, AJ? Um, I think two things, right? The way we solve, or the way we created QR, it, it, the, the idea came about in the shower, right? I do my best thinking in the shower. Um, all the things that I hate about shopping, how can I use technology to solve those things, right? Now, if you just think about it, everything that annoys you, from the potholes to traffic to whatever, every one of those things represents an opportunity of need, okay? And so identify the things that you don't like because nine out of 10 times, everybody else says the same thing that they don't like. And then solve that problem, but do it, right? Don't dream it, do it. Fantastic. And Nomonde? The, the need for change in the technology space is never going to stop. It, the pace of it is actually going to go faster. So as this happens and you have access to those changes immediately, pull someone along with you who ordinarily would not have that access and choice. As you lift up, that other person lifts somebody up. And we, over time, hopefully will close the digital divide that is very prevalent on this continent. Fantastic. Progashni? So I think closing for me, um, I have to say that technology can be actually likened to a signpost. No two people will ever interpret it the same way, mm -hmm. it's never in the same language. And it's really going to be up to you on how you shape and use that to your own advantage. Fantastic. Well, it's been an absolutely awesome panel. Thank you for your participation. And certainly, I think that there are elements of everything that we've been speaking about. It's a, it's a formula and it needs to start, whether it's in the education system, whether it's... Uh, but there is one thing for sure, that the technology around us is enabling business. It's unlocking value. And we just need to find the path to unlocking that value and opening our eyes. But I think that as a, as a group, we all have a collective responsibility to help those businesses, those individuals get onto this path of using technology to enable and, and unlock that particular value in this whole ecosystem that we have in our country. And if we don't do that, we are in serious trouble. So we really have to look at these ways. And I think it's these kinds of conversations that we have, open, frank conversations that we take. We take to our dinner table, we take to our friends, and we replicate what we're talking about. And we ask ourselves, what are we doing as leaders in our respective fields to make sure that these small and medium-sized businesses thrive and use technology in enabling their particular growth going forward. Thank you very, very much to the panel. Give them a round of applause. Pragashni Reddy, Nomonde Watenglovu, AJ Lalu, and Professor Manoj Chiba. And a big thanks to Abdullah Varacha as well for your input. And ladies and gentlemen,